I want you to uh, imagine with me the last time that you lost your composure. The last time that you uh, found yourself in a situation where the stakes felt pretty high and you felt, uh, you knew that there was this need to hold on to, your stealth, to yourself, to stay connected to the person that might be involved in the situation, but uh, you may have failed. Uh, and you may have felt, you know, you feel a bit of, uh, you wish you would have shown up a bit differently, um, but you didn't. So imagine what those situations might look like in your life. And for many of you, um, I'm imagining something that may have happened in the last 24 hours. For some of you, it might be the last week. For those of you that cannot think of a situation like that, there's a different talk for you. <laughs> um, but I have 15 and 13 year old sons and I came home from work uh, recently and I was tired, I was worn out, I had a rough day. Um, and I got home, I worked that day, I think from seven in the morning and it was nine o'clock at night. My wife was gone and I, I looked at the boys and I said, dad's not in a very good mood right now. I've had a rough day. I just need one thing. I need you to be nice to one another. That's all I need. And so I was very clear, right, about what I needed. Five minutes later, I hear them upstairs and then one son comes downstairs the other son walks by, and I catch this as he walks by. You're welcome. <laughs> and it was it, everything inside of me. I just, I, I exploded. I just, I started yelling. I, really? Like, I just asked you five minutes ago. I gave you my situation. It should be clear. And that's what you give me? Like, that's what, and I, and I just, I, it was one of those moments I wasn't very proud of. Um, I did apologize for it later for how I showed up. I still think there, were, there was something they did wrong, but <laughs> it was one of those moments. And so when you think about the situations that you would, you've faced, whatever it is that's, that's caused you to lose your composure, there's probably a variety of things you're thinking about. Some of you, it's, um, it could be a fight with a spouse, that you, you know, something was at stake and you felt like it was personal. Um, it could be an argument with a teenager. This is a difficult time for me. Figure out how to let them go and still have the boundaries. Um, for others of you, you read a post on social media yesterday that was just like, I can't believe what's happening. Like, my, this was my friend, you know, that said this. And, uh, and there's all kinds of these situations. I had another one yesterday. I played tennis. And I was playing with a good friend of mine. And at one point, this is what went through my, I didn't do this, but it went through my mind to take my $200 racket and completely destroy it on the concrete because I was so frustrated about my tennis game, which there's a longer story there. <laughs> um, but these are all these, these moments that we face and it's been so important to me that I've spent the last couple of decades of my life trying to understand, how, I mean, we study what we know, we study what we, what we experience and to try to understand in the leaders that I work with and the people that I work with, how do we maintain our composure under pressure? How do we hold on to ourselves well and stay connected to the people that matter most to us? And I want to suggest that that might be one of the most powerful things that we could learn to do. If we could show up more effectively, that it would have a profound impact on ourselves and on the people around us. And uh, so much so that I, I wrote a, I tried to write a book about it. And you write a book about this, you're writing a book about yourself, right? You're trying to figure out how do I handle those situations with my sons at work, uh, when the stakes are high, if, you know, in places where my, the pressure rises in me. For some of you, it might be public speaking, a very common thing where, what if I could have composed myself better in that moment? Or you're leading for the first time. Uh, you're doing anything for the first time where you feel that pressure. So the, one of the questions I get asked often is, what is pressure? Like how do we, you talk about pressure, what does that mean? And pressure is this, is this kind of like this invisible force that we can't see, but when we, when we feel it, we know something is changing. And the best example I have is when, you know, if you can remember back, you probably can't remember this, those of you who have flown a lot, but the first time you fly, the first time you fly, and I remember I was, I was a child, I'm with my parents, and I remember my ears hurting so bad and I didn't have a way to stop it. I didn't know how to stop it. Now we all, you know, we blow our noses. But pressure on an airplane, in an airplane cabin is interesting because the airplane's taking off, but for the most part, you can't see anything changing. But you can feel it. And you can feel the, the pushback in your seat. So there's all these indicators that something is gonna be different, um, but we can't see it. It's this invisible force that we experience. 
So what I, as I said, I've been working with leaders and, and we, we study this on and what is it that would allow us to show up more effectively in those kinds of situations. And so we have an assessment called the Leading Under Pressure Inventory that, that measures these strategies that allow people to hold on to themselves, to emotionally self-regulate in real time when they're in these situations. So we were curious if we took out whatever is being contributed by personality, so things that are kind of locked in, what is it that people are doing that helps them to stand in those moments really, really well? What is it that allows them to hold on to themselves? It's what Henry Nouwen describes, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he describes, you know, if we could simply live our lives with our feet firmly planted in the stream that runs deep beneath the illusions of acceptance and rejection. I know that's deep, but it's like, you know, can you imagine if, we could, if you could stand in that stream, instead of that stream that's functioning somewhere up here where it's just, I'm, I'm at kind of at the whim of whatever is happening, what would it look like? So when we looked at the, the things that were making the strongest contribution to this, the over, one of the overwhelming variables in people's lives was this, sense of purpose. The extent to which someone knows why they're in the situation in the first place. And so it does require a little bit of preparation because what people often don't think about, I don't often think about, is why am I here in the first place? And there's something about that that helps us, instead of being a ship blown by the storm to any shore that we might show up on, that gives us a navigational direction for where we're going, but we have to have, we have to do a little bit of work to figure out why we're in the situation in the first place. I'm not kidding you. The reason why I still have my $200 tennis racket, I'm not kidding you, is in the moment before that, it was, it was like watching a video of me doing that, literally, because <laughs> um, I was so frustrated, I lost, 11 points in a row. I know how many points I had lost. And what I thought about was, and I have, I have thought about this, I have a, a deep relationship to the game of tennis, and I've started to play again after playing in college. And so I have all this baggage that I carry forward. But the reason why I play, I play now with two of my best friends. So the more important thing than my racket, or even whether I win or not, is really, I'm getting a chance to hang out with two of my best friends and Stay in shape. So the thing that stopped me in that moment was, why are you here? Why are you here? So that sense of purpose is such a powerful thing if we can prepare intentionally for why we're there. That's one part of it. And I know that may sound like it's, okay, I gotta think about why I'm in different situations, but just think about, even in broader categories, why are you a parent? What purpose do you serve as a parent? Or as a spouse? Or as a manager? I know one of my broader purposes as a parent is to give my boys an example of what it means to be a father. I've written this down. So to the extent that I can remember that in those moments, maybe I wouldn't have exploded quite so badly, or maybe I don't as often as I would otherwise. But to remind myself that part of it is to provide that example, but it's also because there's a little part of me, to be honest, where when, when I do lose it with them, because there's a lot of other challenges with teenagers, yes? Um, <laughs> is that on some level it's like they won again. It's not them getting their way, but it's when, when I, it all gets the best of me, you know, and suddenly I become something that I'm not proud of, um, that it isn't, doesn't serve any of us well. The second thing is this, is, uh, is what we, it's a perspective, it's how you see your world. Many of us under, under pressure um, will actually, when we see this pressure situation, what we will focus on is, uh, the, the bad parts of the situation. So what we found is that one of the strongest contributors is what we describe as a focus on potential. Are you able in real time to see possibilities, not just in the midst of barriers, but actually out of the barriers? I have a picture that I show that's a, that's a tree across a road with a road that travels out behind the, behind the tree, and it's a giant tree. And I remember showing that to an executive one, and the executive says, I said, what do you see? And he said, a tree in the road. And I showed that same picture to my sons, and one of my sons says, because we camp a lot, I see firewood. It didn't even occur to him that there was a tree in the road. And then my other son said, you know, if I put a board up that thing, I could make a pretty cool bike jump. And then my other son, as he heard that, said, yeah, and I see the road off behind it. And I hope they maintain that capacity, but to the extent that in real time you're able to see possibilities, in the face of barriers and even ask yourself, 
What are the positive, positive, possible positive outcomes if I am able to maintain a focus on the possibilities uh, and not just the barriers? Um, and that's different. We described that around. It's not, it's not the same as, as pessimism or optimism. The, half is, the glass is half full or half empty. But it's, it's saying, I have a half full glass of water. What could I do with that? In what ways could I use that? There's, there's possibilities in the midst of, of situations where we don't necessarily see them unless we're actively looking for them. This happens to work very well in our data. As we've studied this, we looked at this, uh, there's a, a few thousand people now that we've looked at, for people who take things personally. And I don't want to get a raise of hands, but uh, here's what's interesting. In our data, we looked at this this past week. What percentage of people have admitted that they take things personally on a self-report measure? Admitted it. And it's 38%. So I imagine that the number is actually quite a bit higher for the percentage of us who take things personally. Because when we get under pressure, it feels like a personal attack. You know what I mean? Someone's, someone's challenging your identity. They're challenging your worth. Like, uh, and it, what's interesting is my wife and I both, I'm going to out both of us, we took the leading under pressure inventory and we both score low on a, on a it's called, it isn't personal. So we both take things personally. And we looked at it and we looked at each other and we were, the look on our faces was, Oh, like this is why we don't fight well. Because what our, our, our arguments sometimes look at is, everything I say is personal. Everything I say, yeah, what you said. Everything I say is personal. So for people, especially for those of us, we're, we're, we're invested. Like, thinking that it's personal because it is personal oftentimes, but not all the time. This is the most powerful form. Those, those two variables I described are so powerful for people who do that. And so to the extent that we can come into these situations, uh, having thought about why we're in the situation in the first place, with an active ability to say, okay, I understand that some of these barriers are real, but at the same time to look for possibilities on the horizon and say, what could be the positive, positive outcomes of this if I were to hold on to myself in this? Um, it could have a, a profound impact on the people around us. And I would argue that this ability to compose ourselves, um, whether you're a, you think of yourself as a leader or not, um, is one of the most important and revolutionary things we could do to impact not only how we show up, but also to impact the, the people that we love and care about who, are, who need this from us, even when it's most difficult to do so. And that's my hope for myself, and that's my hope for you too. Thank you.